to the Dirasat uh, event today on the, um, the titled After Abqiq, the Future of the U.S. Security Commitment to the Gulf. My name is Omar Avedli uh, and I will be chairing today's discussion. We are very fortunate to have an incredibly distinguished uh, selection of speakers. Uh, we have um, at the bottom left of my screen, at least, I don't know if he's the bottom left of your screen, uh, Bilal Saab, who's a political military analyst at the Middle East and US policy, uh, in, in, on the Middle East and US policy towards the region. And he is the senior fellow and director of the Defense and Security Program in the Middle East Institute in USA. Uh, we also have uh, Ambassador uh, Martin Indyk, who's a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. He was formerly the US ambassador to Israel. Uh, and we also have Dr. Dania Khatib, who is an affiliated scholar at the Sam Faris Institute of Public Policy and International Affairs at AUB. Uh, so we have uh, uh, both regional and extra regional participants or uh, speakers. So we're very uh, fortunate to have such a, a diverse range of expertise. The format for today's session will be that we will be talking, uh, it will be a discussion among the speakers for approximately one hour. And after that, uh, we will open the floor for questions uh, and we will happily uh, uh, take those questions and give an opportunity to the speakers to respond to them. So without further ado, I would like to uh, uh, start with the first question uh, uh, to uh, His Excellency Ambassador Indik. Um, the title of this talk is After Baqiq. The events itself were quite shocking. Uh, we haven't seen anything quite so uh, uh, direct uh, on Saudi territory or in the territory of any of the Gulf countries for some time. Uh, and afterwards, uh, some were surprised, some were perhaps not so surprised by the uh, lack of a direct military response or an in-kind military response. Uh, so then that really brings the question, um, be it from the US or from Saudi Arabia. Uh, so that, bring, that begs a, a, a broader question, which is why does the US have a, a, an interest in the region at all, in the Gulf region? What, what brings the US to the region? What is it trying to achieve in terms of its macro geopolitical strategy? Thank you, Omar, and thank you for the invitation to uh, participate in this uh, conversation uh, with my uh, friends and colleagues. Uh, I think it's good that you uh, start by widening the lens uh, and uh, trying to understand Abu in, um, in the broader context of US strategy. Um, as you may know, I've been arguing uh, recently that uh, it's time for uh, American uh, foreign policy experts to start to come to terms with uh, a new reality that is reflected in the Trump administration's uh, response to Abu Ghraib, uh, which is that uh, our interests, that is to say American interests, in uh, the Gulf uh, have changed. And I would argue have changed rather dramatically. Uh, and this is reflected in not only the policy pursued by Donald Trump, but it was reflected in the policy pursued by Barack Obama when he was president and is certainly reflected, and Bilal can tell you more about this than I know, uh, in the planning and deployment of US forces by the Pentagon. What I'm referring to is the simple fact that the United States itself is no longer dependent on Middle Eastern oil. That dependency, uh, together with the fact that uh, oil flowing out of the Gulf in particular, uh, provided fueled the industries uh, of the West and the East, all of America's major trading partners. Uh, but the combination of those two meant that we had for at least the last four or five decades, a vital strategic interest in the free flow of oil at reasonable prices 
out of the Gulf. And as a result of that uh, definition of a vital strategic interest, which was a bipartisan consensus, the United States deployed forces in the Gulf uh, to ensure the free flow of oil, mostly naval forces with the important naval base in, in Bahrain. Uh, but after Saddam Hussein's invasion of uh, Kuwait, 1991, that changed um, because of the shock that that created uh, to uh, the, the pl military planning system in the United States. So we had to kind of dramatically shift 500,000 troops over to the Gulf uh, in, in short order meant that military planners do what they have to do and figure, well, if we've got to plan for that again, then we need a, a more sustainable arrangement. And so from that point on, we established bases in the Gulf. The most notable one, of course, is in, in Qatar, al Odaid Air Base. We had bases in Saudi Arabia, um, which no longer exist now because it was not comfortable for either Saudi Arabia or the United States to keep them there. Uh, of course, they're in Bahrain, they're in the UAE, we have pre-positioning in Kuwait. You probably know all the details, but I know that Bilal can, can uh, do, uh, explain that better than me. Uh, but the point was, we built up uh, an ability to intervene dramatically and quickly. And that... Uh, ability was driven by a sense that we had a vital strategic interest. Now the situation has changed. Uh, the priority for US military planners is in Asia. Uh, the rise of China and the rise of China as a military power, uh, potentially threatening our strategic interest in Asia, has become a much larger, higher priority. And so you've got this shift. The, the Gulf has, has reduced in priority because it's no longer vital for us to ensure the free flow of oil, at least to the United States. And to the extent that we need to provide assurances about the free flow of oil to China, well, there's a question mark as to why the hell we should be doing that. Uh, but China is the biggest uh, consumer today of uh, oil that comes from the Gulf. Uh, and so uh, the combination uh, of the, the priority, the pivot to Asia in strategic terms and the reduction in the importance of the Gulf for the United States has combined, I think, to downgrade the interests we have in the region in the Gulf region in particular, to a, an important interest, but not a vital interest. And what's the difference? Not an interest in which we would need to go to war again for. And that is reinforced by a sense amongst the American public that it's not worth it. That uh, the vast expenditure of, of blood and treasure by the United States in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the longest wars in American history. And we can certainly debate whether they were wise in the first place. But nevertheless, the American public has concluded that it's not worth it. That all we ended up with, with was a big mess. So there will be an extreme reluctance on the part of the American people to support uh, wars like those that we have fought in the last two decades in the Gulf. Uh, and without the vital interest there, I don't see the circumstances in which um, we therefore need to plan uh, and to have the, these bases in the region that uh, we now have. And you already see the Pentagon shifting resources away. Before the increase in tension around Upcake, but it was much more about Iranian aggressive activities against US forces, residual US forces uh, around the same time, uh, we didn't have an aircraft carrier task force in the Gulf, um, which was kind of amazing. 
in my time in government, when I was responsible for the Gulf, uh, we would have uh, at least one on station all the time, and usually two because of the rotation. Uh, and that was a hell of a lot of firepower that we deployed in the Gulf. To go down to zero uh, is, I think, a, a, a manifestation of this shift that I'm describing. So I think that's important to put Abukhaik in that context. The last point I wanted to make on this, Omar, is that both Obama and Trump, notwithstanding their extreme differences, agreed that we had to reduce our military profile in the region, bring the troops home, try to avoid engagement in, in military conflicts in the region. So all of the, what I've been describing has found expression in both a Democratic president and a Republican president. And therefore, I think you will see continuity in this, regardless of who becomes president uh, after November. Okay, so I have a follow-up question, but I will come back to that. First of all, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Dania, um, you're an expert on U.S.-Arab relations. Yes. Uh, Ambassador Indik was speaking as if U.S. policy is an integrated, unique uh, uh, phenomenon. Uh, mm -hmm. But actually, U.S. foreign policy, you know, there's many hands that play a role in U.S. foreign policy. There's the White House, there's yes. the State Department, there's the Department yeah. of Defense. Uh, I think recently one of the Senate members, uh, Murphy, I believe, met J uh, Jawad Darif, uh, the Iranian foreign minister, uh, and, and that caused some controversy. So who, who, on, you know, who is deciding U.S. policy towards the region at the moment? Is it the White House? Is it the State Department? Who, who, where, where is the decision made? Well, well, the U.S. is a presidential system, so the president has a lot to do. Uh, um, the Congress has a role mainly in uh, when it comes to appropriation, to giving money, to dispensing money in the budget. But on the day to day, they, they, they are not the ones who make the decision. Actually, the Congress usually, I mean, if you go to see a senator, a senator, he's probably on two, three committees. They, they don't know the intricacy. They don't know the details. So basically, if you brief a senator, it's totally then briefing the State Department. Where, for example, in the White House, the NSE, there is specialization and there is more specialization in the State Department. State Department, there is like for the Near East, then there is for the Levant, then for each country, there are a desk with two people, men. So, and it's a discussion. Usually, for example, the day-to-day, -day, the decisions are made by the State Department and the White House, the NSC and the State Department. However, the Congress has a role because it could be a disruptive role, which, for example, they can, like now, there was an attempt by the Congress to put, uh, when you talk to the region, to sanction Saudi Arabia, to, to put a resolution to, you know, that would have had a big effect on the U.S.-Arab relation. Or now, for example, Biden is saying, I will stop the war in Yemen, or there were, you know, Congress members who were thinking about um, issuing a resolution to stop the war in Yemen. So this is where the Congress role is. But the Congress is not involved in the nitty gritty of every day because they, they usually don't know. They don't know and it's not their job. It's usually between the State Department and the White House. But there is also always a consultation. And also the Congress takes a lot of feedback from the DOD. For example, if they want to do, to issue a resolution that is against U.S. national interest, there is always the DOD that gives the feedback, uh, that, you know, brief them. And also the Congress is different because the Congress usually, each Congress member is very much influenced by his, his constituency, by the public opinion. Where if you talk about like the State Department, they're appointed, uh, appointment officials. So they have a more overall uh, picture. They look at the national national interest overall, uh, whereas the Congress people they are very much influenced by by their constituency, by interest groups. But I mean, to go back to to cap, uh, the main uh, decision for foreign policy is usually the State Department and the White House. 
the Congress, as I told you, can affect, but not today, today. And also it depends how much the issue is important to the average American. And, and do you see, uh, at the moment, do you see Congress and the State, uh, sorry, excuse me, the State Department and the White House having their views generally aligned on these issues? Or do you see any tension between uh, the Which State issues and the you White mean House on the, on, on the, on the Gulf region? No, they are, they are more or less more or less aligned. There is always, um, it means you can. I mean, more or less they are aligned. Generally, they are aligned. You know, because these are both appointed, appointed, uh, uh, appointed official by the administration. So there is a general direction, and now it's mostly very positive towards the Gulf. The attitude. And and, and is that based, uh, so does the policy of the State Department and the White House, is it based on a doctrine on sort of a white papers that are published or is it developed very much day to day? No, I don't, it's not, it's not the, the issue of white paper, it's the issue, uh, you know, during the time of Obama there was, especially with his, um, uh, the deal with Iran, the GCPOA, this created some tension with Saudi Arabia, especially with Saudi Arabia. So President Trump, his for first, uh, he was very adamant on repairing the relation. He was very adamant on repairing the relation with Israel and with the Saudi Arabia, with the Gulf. So in general, in the general, the relation is more or less good. Uh, with with Trump, with Trump uh, and and uh, Saudi Arabia and Gulf region. Okay, uh, Bilal. Uh, so I have a military question for you. Uh, Ask me that. Do you mind if I comment very quickly on on this yes, issue? Yes, please. Uh, I will submit to you. It's rather odd that I comment on the internal machinery of U.S. foreign policy, uh, given the fact that I've only served for one year, and Martin obviously has served for decades, but uh, just a quick observation from a distance. Um, there is really nothing new about having tensions amongst bureaucracies in the government, uh, legislative, executive. Uh, but I think Dania is absolutely right. It all starts with the commander in chief himself. And for now it's been himself, not herself. Um, personality, priorities, uh, his style, his very level of interest in foreign policy overall. That is very important. This is where it all starts. Um, and his ability obviously to gather around as, as large a coalition from various bureaucracies as possible. There really is nothing new about that tension in foreign policy. Uh, what we've been able to do for a long time is hide those tensions uh, and still come up with relatively coherent policies. And we were pretty good at that during the Cold War because the very threat of the Soviet Union compelled us to be more competent, to be more coherent in our behavior abroad. A lot of that changed after the solution of the Soviet Union. And to take it to more recent years, um, you're starting to see rather unprecedented fashion, some pretty significant tensions between what the State Department is trying to do in the region and what the Pentagon is trying to do in the region. You know, when you have the, um, most military, uh, most powerful military uh, instrument in the region that CENTCOM for you, telling you that the maximum pressure campaign against Iran is precisely a State Department construct and that we have nothing to do with it and that there is no security aspect to it, you can definitely see a tension amongst two major bureaucracies on such a core issue, which is the Iranian challenge. I'm not sure we ever had that before. And the Pentagon is playing catch up, essentially. And like I said before, it all starts with the commander in chief uh, and his level of interest, his competence, his view, his priorities. Um, I would slightly also challenge what Dania said regarding the consensus, uh, even within Congress, but also between Congress and the White House on the very critical relationship with the Saudis. Now you're seeing an increasingly bipartisan consensus on the fact that there is a crisis in the relationship with the Saudis. Obviously, that's not shared with the White House. This president sees the Saudi relationship as a pillar. Uh, he's close friends with MBS. He certainly has a different view on how to deal with the Saudis than now an increasing number of Republican influential members of Congress. So I'm not sure we really had such clear and significant tensions in the US government system as, as now, frankly. Um, and that 
hopefully will change with the new administration. Uh, but for now, those fault lines, those tensions are certainly having adverse effects on our ability to uh, pursue our objectives in the Middle East. So before I ask you a question, Dr. Yeah. Dani has a quick uh, intervention. Yes, I didn't say, I didn't say, the question was between the State Department and the White House. I said, and the question was how the decision making is done in general. I didn't speak specifically on Saudi Arabia. Actually, I gave as an example as Saudi Arabia when there was, uh, you know, suggestion to sanction them by the, by the Congress, by Lindsey Graham, and suggestion to stop the war in Yemen. So this is where I said there are disruptions, but the overall policy is drafted by the, by the state and the White House and the president. The buck stops with the president. It's a presidential system. Uh, so Bilal, the, uh, my question to you regards the military bases in the region. Uh, the U.S. has a very, very large number of military installations uh, active in the Middle East. Uh, and the question is, I mean, what is the, the value of the marginal? I mean, what's the point of having 15 as opposed to 14 bases or whatever the value is? Uh, as an economist, to me, this is an indication of probably some sort of bureaucratic, uh, 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 bureaucratic creep. Uh, if the Pentagon's been able to get more and more bases, they're not going to say no. And they're just going to have more and more and more bases. Why not? Nobody turns down the opportunity to have more resources under their long-term control. But I ask you, as a, as a military specialist, what, what, is the, what is the purpose served by having so many bases in so many countries uh, in the region? Well, there used to be a purpose, and Martin was right. I mean, we, uh, at some point, we were very worried about Soviet aspirations in Southeast Asia, and uh, if those were to go south to the Persian Gulf. I mean, that's what brought up the Carter Doctrine, right? Uh, and then after that, we created the rapid deployment force. A couple of years later, that turned into CENTCOM and, you know, they gave it teeth. Um, and then Reagan came in, not to be outdone by his predecessor, he came up with the Reagan Corollary. So it was no longer just to preserve the territorial integrity of the Gulf states, but also their internal stability. I mean, at the time, if you remember, uh, Northern Yemen was, was going to hell. The communists were about to take over. And so they gave it a threat to the Saudis. Reagan came over and then he said, now we're going to preserve the internal stability of these countries and primarily Saudi Arabia. Um, obviously, the Soviet Union threat is gone. Uh, Saddam Hussein invaded in 1991 um, and that further expanded the military presence. So now you ask yourself the question, which is the one that you're asking me, what purpose does that still serve? Um, look, the main two principles of this expanded uh, military presence um, have not changed and those remain deterrence and reassurance. Now on the deterrence level I think you could have a good case to make that you don't necessarily need such a large footprint to deter now a conventionally inferior adversary and that would be the Iranians. Um, I want to add to that basket the Russians now but I'm not sure that the Russians um, are capable of uh, creating uh, as significant a threat as Saudi Arabia, as uh, the Soviet Union was before. Um, and the Chinese, I don't think they've made a decision uh, to uh, project power. I'm not sure they're actually capable to project power as effectively as the United States is. And I'm not sure that they have that desire because they very much benefit from free riding on US security. Why would you commit military resources when the United States is the one providing security? So you end up with Iran as the number one military challenge, except that the Iranians are playing a very different game, obviously. They're the ones who have mastered the art of asymmetric warfare that is not very suitable for the kind of presence that we have in the region. Not to mention that the more stuff and the more hardware and the more people you have in the region, that makes them also a liability uh, to the range of missiles that the Iranians have developed over the past uh, few years. So on the issue of deterrence, it's a, such a complex you know, equation. It's not just about the uh, capabilities that we deploy, but it's also uh, our ability to convince the Iranians not to pursue certain courses of action because they will be costly to them. So there is, there's a credibility factor there and credibility is much more than just the deployment of military power, obviously. Um, it's also about our own behavior, our own words, the consistency of what we say and what we do 
And as you said yourself in the very beginning, we're, we haven't been very consistent about when to intervene, when not to intervene, and what to say and when not to say. The other complex element of this large footprint is reassurance. And we have to also reassure our partners in that part of the world. And that becomes even more complicated because there's a psychological element to that as well. Um, and it's hard to control how partners feel. And we have that same dynamic in Europe. We have that same dynamic in Asia. It's not just about, once again, the troops that we have. It's also reassuring them when we're going to use them, how and if. It's never been clear. Let's be very clear about that. Never been clear, despite the issuance of the Carter Doctrine and the Reagan Corollary, when, how, if we would militarily intervene in the face of danger. Now, once again, we did that with Operation Desert Shield, followed by Desert Storm, 1991. But there were many other cases, and of course, the Tanker War, when it started to heat up in 84. But after that, there were several incidents, uh, and Martin can attest to those, uh, where <coughs> something really significant happened in the region, and we just didn't lift a finger. So 96 Khobar Towers, they blew up two compounds, right, uh, that led to the deaths of 16 or 17 U.S. airmen. And the Clinton administration did consider retaliation, but ultimately pursued rapprochement with the Iranians. Um, you're based in Bahrain now, 2011, uh, the, the uprising in the country. It became clear, having intercepted communications, us, between uh, Iranians based in Iraq and local saboteurs or insurgents, you want to call them, in Bahrain, we knew that the Iranians had a hand in exacerbating the situation uh, and in sending uh, money and arms uh, to um, locals who had allegiances to Iran. And the Obama administration didn't do anything about it. Um, and so there's really nothing automatic, nothing automatic about our intervention, uh, military intervention in that part of the world to uh, protect our partners from danger. It, it's always going to be based on the contingency itself, on what kind of administration you have and how they view priorities and how they manage risk and make certain trade-offs. You have to remember that nothing legally obligates us to intervene in that part of the world. We do not have any defense pact with any of these countries, not even the Israelis, okay? Uh, and so, uh, it is nothing really unique about the Trump administration when he said, if you recall, you know, my casus belli is when an American life is lost or is in serious danger, this is when I'm going to intervene. There's nothing unique about that. It might be more obnoxious or aggressive in style, but there's really in substance nothing unique about it uh, because, once again, nothing legally obligates us to intervene. Um, We'll see what the next administration does uh, because that security commitment is increasingly in question. And, uh, and you know what that means as far as consequences. That means hedging bets. That means the fraying of the relationship with many of these partners. Uh, Ambassador Indik, when you described uh, the pillar, the um, key factors determining US interests in the Gulf, you mentioned oil, uh, but the other factor that uh, describes or impacts uh, upon or determines U.S. interests in the Middle East is also the relationship with Israel. Uh, so you described how uh, oil and the changing U.S. demand for oil and the changing importance of st stable oil prices globally has changed over how that's changed over the last 20 years and, and therefore how U.S. interests have changed in the region. How has the uh, uh, dynamic, the Israeli-U.S. dynamic changed in the last 20 years? And what are the implications of that for U.S. military activity in the Middle East? Uh, thanks, Amar. I think that that's a, uh, a good uh, thing to focus on in the context of Gulf security. And I'll come back to explain why. Uh, but to answer your question directly, uh, I believe that uh, America's interest in Israel have changed as well. It's not just uh, uh, the way that we view uh, the Gulf. Um, Israel, uh, since its uh, creation back in 1948, uh, has tended to be seen by the United States uh, as a small, embattled, uh, democratic, uh, westernized country uh, surrounded by uh, 
hostility from countries much more, much larger in number and more powerful. And it was that image of uh, Israel struggling for its survival as a democratic outpost uh, that garnered a lot of support in the United States, again, bipartisan support. Uh, but even though that was the perception, the uh, commitment to Israel uh, was a long time coming in terms of a security commitment. Uh, arms sales only began in the 1960s uh, and the interesting fact is that they only, the uh, arms relationship with Israel only got a major boost as a result of Israel's willingness to concede territories it had occupied in 1967 for the sake of reaching peace agreements uh, or interim agreements and then peace agreements with its neighbors, starting with Egypt. And, and uh, you know, it may sound incongruous that um, peacemaking produced this strategic relationship with Israel, but that is in fact what, what happened. The United States and Israel became strategic partners in pursuing peace, such that Israel's willingness to take risks for peace by giving up tangible territory, um, Arab territory, giving back that Arab territory, uh, produced uh, tangible commitments on the United States part to make up for the the uh, lack of tangible commitments on the Arab side or the intangible commitments to peace or normal relations or so on. And so as a result of that, uh, you saw a major boost in Israel's military capabilities uh, through the 1970s in particular was the big breakthrough as Israel made peace with Egypt. And of course, as Israel made peace with Egypt, in a sense, the need for those massive arms supplies went down because with Egypt out of the war, uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, there was no way that the Arab states could muster the power to take on Israel militarily. Uh, and so, you know, ironically, Israel's power was given a great boost at a time when the conventional threats to Israel were going down, not, not up. But that's not the way it was perceived at the time and not the way it's been perceived since. But over the years, um, Israel became partner, strategic partner, an ally, strategic cooperation, intelligence cooperation. As Israel's military capabilities grew, um, the United States came to uh, work more closely with Israel on the strategic and military and intelligence level, development of weapon systems, uh, and in the end, in critical moments, a willingness to turn to Israel to seek um, its help uh, where necessary in the protection of American interests in the Arab world. Um, the most obvious case of that was in Jordan in 1970. We don't have time to go into it now, but that did solidify the strategic relationship. Today, we have a situation in which Israel is, uh, without doubt, by far the most powerful uh, country in the Middle East region, the most, has the most powerful army, uh, is rumored to have nuclear weapons as well, uh, is estimated to, be the, to have the fourth largest military uh, capability in the world. And, um, uh, therefore has a formidable strategic capability. Uh, and it's, out, it's, it's there in the Middle East. As Gulf Arab interests in combating Iran have, have increased with the threat from Iran, and as US reliability has tended to decrease for all the reasons we've been discussing, they have looked to Israel. Simple proposition, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And there is now 
it's not a secret anymore, strategic cooperation between Israel and the Gulf Arab states. They're also, by the way, although it's beyond our discussion today, their strategic cooperation between Israel and Egypt and between Israel and Jordan uh, as well. And so in, in, in a way, nature abhors a vacuum. Israel has begun to fill the vacuum being left by uh, this phenomenon of US retrenchment from the region. Of course, there's a glass ceiling to how far this can go. It's been going on under the table for some time. In fact, Israeli Saudi uh, security cooperation goes back to the 1960s when uh, Nasser intervened in Yemen and Saudi Arabia looked to the Israelis to provide weapons to the uh, tribes that it was supporting in Yemen. Uh, but it's really developed now in, in, in many different ways uh, with the Gulf Arab states. Uh, and and um, that is, in a sense, a way in which, which our interests have shifted, uh, where we now look to Israel to help to the things that we're not prepared to do anymore. I would also say our interests have shifted in terms of looking to Saudi Arabia more than we did before. And I'm sure we'll come back to that again. But in terms of the vital interest we once identified as supporting the survival and security of Israel, the job's done. Israel doesn't face the kind of uh, threats it faced in the past, and it's much more powerful to deal with the threats that it is facing, particularly from Iran, than, than uh, it ever was in the past. Uh, and so therefore, uh, Israel's survival and well-being is, you know, you can kind of check, it's done. Of course, it continues to look to us for support, uh, particularly in times of, of uh, war and crisis. And as an ally and a partner of the United States, we will continue to have an interest in providing that. But, but the idea that we now have a, a vital interest in, in Israel's security is no longer relevant. Okay, uh, Dr. Dania. Um, yes. After so, uh, the January 2020, uh, Qasem Soleimani was... Uh, assassinated yeah. by the the US, yeah. is that going back to the topic of Abqir, Is that a, um, a, a, is part of a response to Abqir, or do you think it would have happened anyway, even if uh, the Abqir attacks hadn't happened? Was it something that US has been trying to do or wanting to do for some time? How do you uh, how do you think it falls into the broader picture? Well, I don't think it has to do with Aqaiq as Aqaiq, but it has to do but because Iran has been really pushing the limit. If you want to link it to uh, as a response, it would be more linked to the attack on the American embassy in Iraq, where the mob attacked it and one American, one or two American, you know, contractor died. Uh, and I think uh, regarding Soleimani, regarding Soleimani, when US was in Iraq, they had two chances to eliminate him and they didn't because they thought it would create too much, like a very strong response on the Iranian side. Uh, Trump took the action, took the action, you know, when he had the target opportunity, he took it. And, and you know, the Iranian, they keep on pushing the limit. You know, they let them, you, they keep on pushing the limit. Don't forget, just let's go back a little bit before, before, before the killing of Soleimani, before the attack on, uh, on the embassy, what did happen? You know, the Iranian shot a non-manned uh, aircraft, 50, 50 million dollar worth aircraft for, for the American. Trump said, uh, probably they did it by mistake. Then the Iranian went in an act of defiance and they said, no, it's not by mistake. We know exactly what it was and we shut it down. Okay, so it was a clear defiance and you know, and he wanted to hit Iran and then 10 minutes before he called off the, the hit. And actually I think it was a kind of response to recreate uh, a deterrence force against Iran, but at the same time without going to a war to Iran. You know, if he had, you know, bombed Iran, mainland Iran, 
that would be like going to war in Iran with Iran. But Soleimani is an enemy combatant, you know, legally, he's someone who had killed American soldiers. So where did he kill the, he was targeted? He was targeted in Iraq, you know, and he's an enemy combatant. So in a way, I think it's smart because you created deterrence. At the same time, you didn't go into a full-fledged war with Iran. And you know, it was time. You know, actually the, the, the hit, the, the assassination, the targeted killing of Soleimani was very well viewed in very few people like Bernie Sanders and, and you know, Warren, they said it's an assassination, but it was well viewed by the way in, in the US because they felt it, you know, it's created a deterrence that deterrence force that uh, Jan Petraeus, you know, the firm, former head of the CENTCOM, he said, uh, uh, Trump re-established by the killing of Soleimani, re-established this terms that the U.S. was losing because Iran was hitting and doing whatever and no one was stopping them. So I don't think, but for, I am sure it's not as a response for Abke. If you want to say it was a response for, for uh, the attack on the embassy, okay. the attack on the U.S. embassy in Iraq. So Bilal, uh, uh, Dr. Dania mentioned the attacks uh, the skirmishes uh, with U.S. forces in the uh, in the in the Gulf area, uh, for example, down in the in the U.S. Uh, uh, drone and so on and so forth. Um, a few years ago, there was a problem in the Red Sea with Somali pirates, uh, and and when that happened, within a matter of or quite you know uh, by international standards, uh, very quickly uh, an international coalition was was formed. Uh, and the problem was eradicated through genuine multilateral uh, uh, cooperation. In, uh, in, in the Straits of Hormuz, uh, Hormuz, arguably even worse forms of banditry and piracy were going on uh, uh, during 2019. Uh, but at no point did we see, you know, some sort of international coalition form. And when the U.S., you know, made its, uh, uh, made efforts to uh, establish a secure maritime security that didn't wasn't anywhere near the enthusiasm to join in it as there was when people were dealing with somali pirates in the red sea despite the you know very high arguably even higher economic importance of the straits of Hormuz to the world economy than you know compared to the red sea so why is it that we went from a situation where pirates led to a, a very rapid formation of an international coalition to a situation where even worse forms of sabotage were met with indifference from many countries. I mean, look, I'll say this half jokingly. It's easier to fight pirates with flip flops on than Iranian paramilitaries. I mean, you know, it's uh, of course. <laughs> the nature of the threat obviously matters here. But uh, I don't necessarily agree that we haven't done much to try to secure the waters of the Persian Gulf. As a matter of fact, I'm one of the very few who actually is a fan of Operation Sentinel. I mean, I had the chance to investigate it um, several times, go to the NAFSANT headquarters in Bahrain and speak to the Admiral, currently Jim Malloy, try to better understand what that construct is all about. It is unique in many ways. Um, and it is, I would still say international, even though I'd love to see more contribution from the Europeans who obviously are doing their own separate thing for policy disagreements or concerns that they have with, with the administration because obviously they want to avoid any kind of military confrontation with the Iranians. Um, but Operation Sentinel is, I would say, a serious maritime security construct uh, in, uh, in that part of the world. And it's not easy, Ahmad. It's a large maritime area. Um, and uh, we could have obviously, like I said, done a better job including the more Europeans into it, not just the British, and the Australians, and the Saudis, and the Emiratis. Uh, what about now, the, the Chinese, and Chinese and the Indians? I mean, in, in Somalia, China and India were participating. Where are they now? Why are they not helping out in the Straits of Hormuz? Because like I said, it's also an issue of capabilities. I don't think the Chinese can muster the, or deploy the kind of capabilities to that part of the world so far away from their own core sphere of influence in Asia, like they did against lightly armed pirates. Um, and, and I'm not sure we made a decision to start including the Chinese. I don't think that strategic decision has been made yet. 
we still are concerned. I mean, I don't need to remind you what the top priority of the uh, national defense strategy is, which is to compete with the Chinese. There's an argument to be made of including them in that part of the world because it should be, you know, all about promoting burden sharing, right? I mean, this is a concern that we've raised several times in this administration, the previous administration about free riding. And of course, the Chinese are masters at free riding in that part of the world. They're the ones who rely the most on the oil flowing from uh, the region. But I still do not believe, and you can call it attention, I still do not believe that we made that strategic decision to actually include the Chinese in that maritime construct. Um, so it's not just an issue of capabilities, but it's also an issue of willingness. Um, I would love to see, like I said, greater involvement from European allies in Operation Sentinel, but that requires much greater policy coherence and uh, a level of reassurance to the Europeans on what the maximum pressure campaign is all about, because they are very much concerned that this would lead to war and military confrontation that certainly they want to avoid. Um, so that's the main difference why there was a greater, a more immediate international response to pirates as opposed to you know the entire Iranian Navy, which obviously has more capability. Okay, so let me, you mentioned China, let's move, uh, or we talked about China, let's move to the can, issue uh, of, I, uh, yes, Dr. Dani, please. Yeah, I, I just have an, uh, a small point to add to what Bilal said. Also, you have countries that are doing their own thing, like Japan, the US asked them to join, they said no, but they're still sending the military vessel to escort, you know, their, uh, their tankers. So you have also countries that are doing their own thing because they don't want to be involved, as Bilal said. So it's not as, uh, as cohesive as, as in uh, Somalia. Okay. So in the, on the topic of, uh, of Japan, um, you know, so the ambassador mentioned, okay, the U.S. doesn't have the same interests uh, in, in the region as it used to. But, you know, purportedly, you know, pivot to Asia and so on. The U.S. has partners in Asia, namely Japan, Taiwan, uh, South Korea. They're supposed to be uh, have a, a bigger focus than they did before. How important is it for the U.S.'s credibility in the Far East for it to protect its partners in the Gulf? If if you're Japan or Taiwan, do you look at what happened after Peir, or more specifically, what didn't happen, and think, oh my God? We can't count on these guys, uh, or is there a way? Can you separate these two out uh, and, and and cultivate a, a reputation in the Far East that is independent of what's going on in the Gulf? This is for me. Uh, this is not for Bilal. Oh. Well, I mean, you could also say the same about the decision to remove some troops from Germany, and then the Gulf states are wondering, when is that gonna to happen to us, right? And when the president himself says that, I'm gonna remove all the troops from Saudi Arabia if you don't stop your oil war with the Russians. So look, the issue of credibility is difficult to operationalize, but I would like to believe that it certainly has an effect. You know, it's, um, the United States is blessed with having such a large network of alliances and partnerships, but it's also a burden because whatever you do with one of them is going to affect what you do with the other. And everybody watches what we do because obviously we are the preeminent power and we're the, you know, beating heart of NATO and uh, the most relevant actor in the Middle East. And, you know, we're sort of still the hub and everybody else is the spokes. So yes, it has an effect, but I can't really tell you how I could, measure it uh, other than anxieties and feelings of abandonment, but I'm sure Martin has other thoughts about this. Oh, well, I do. Okay. I think, Go ahead, uh, Ambassador. That, um, that for sure, there is a demonstration effect. There's no question about that. Countries that are dependent upon us for their security look at what we do in other parts of the world to test our resolve. But they're also smart enough to know that uh, one size doesn't fit all. And in particular, our Asian allies can see what we're doing to build up our capabilities in their region. Uh, Singaporeans who are, in a sense, most at stake, they're in many ways most vulnerable, are watching very carefully uh, this one metric for them, which is number of American warships in their uh, region. 
Uh, and that for them is far more important than uh, what we do in, in the Gulf. And in some ways, they've stood by and watched while we've got ourselves, you know, dragged down into the quagmires of these wars in the Middle East and uh, have been trying to put up their hands, say, what about us here? We're exposed to China. And uh, I think that, that what they, they are far more focused on is um, how we behave in, in their neighborhood. And of course, the way Trump behaved with uh, North Korea, it raised far more questions than, than what it, we did or we didn't do in, in the Gulf. Okay. Uh, oh, can I add to... something to that? Yes, go ahead, Villa. I mean, Martin's right. Especially the the Arab states, and particularly in the in the Gulf era, they really are experts at watching, observing every movement of U.S. military troops, and whether we have a carrier or a carry and a half. How long is it going to depart? When is it going to come back? But to be fair to them, also, I mean, you don't also want to exaggerate that. What matters more is the level of competence that we have and the level of involvement that we have with these guys uh, and, and what we did with the Iran nuclear deal. There was an opportunity to include them in that process and to address their security concerns. That would have been far more consequential and significant than, you know, whether we are removing five or six more soldiers from the region or uh, we're relocating a carrier uh, to another region. So. They also watch our confidence. And a lot of smart people in this town have recently written about how the United States has become, you know, uh, uh, criticized by our allies and partners around the world for being less competent and how we've dealt with the whole COVID crisis. So policy matters, competence matters uh, as much as, you know, our military hardware and our uh, deployments uh, around the world. Uh, Dr. Dania, uh, some, uh, some people say that a lot of the problems in the Middle East in terms of instability, terrorism and so on, mm. are ultimately uh, related to the Isra continuation of the Israeli-Palestinian yeah. conflict. And if that's the case, then in principle it would be in the US's interest to resolve that problem. But the actions the US are taking at the moment seem to be making the problem worse, whether it's, you know, uh, it used to stop Israel from annexing territories. It used to yeah. make something more balanced in terms of resolution, but now it seems to be much more one-sided. So do you agree that resolving the US Palestine, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict would be would serve US interests? And if so, if you do agree, why do you think they're doing such a bad job? Well, first of all, I totally agree that the Israeli-Palestinian issue is crucial it's like the background for all our problems, for many of our problems. Let me tell you, because we spoke at the beginning about the role of the Congress and the State Department. And I said something that there are issues, like, you know, like the relation with, I don't know, Nepal, that it's not of importance to the average American. It's totally handled by the State Department and the White House. But the Israel issue is an issue that it is more of, it, it's, it's, almost a domestic issue you know the interest groups are very active now it's changed by the way the typography of the uh, pro-israeli group have changed a lot yeah we won't go into that because that's another that's another discussion but the israel issue has always been a domestic issue there was always a lot of pressure from the congress even when the administration tried to do anything it was always blocked by the congress you know whether it was bush senior whether it was obama it was always a push from the congress to block any pressure on israel to make any concession so that's why the us didn't do uh, didn't really, and this is what we say in the Arab world, the U.S. is not an honest broker. Hala, if you come back to me, uh, why, why it is important, why it is important, you know, Obama said, I mean, if you talk to any pro-Israeli commentator or analyst, he tells you, look, Sunnis and Shia are killing themselves, killing each other, and Israel has nothing to do about it. That's what also Obama said in one uh, in a platform. He said, listen, please, Arabs, don't blame Israel anymore. You see, 
Sunni and Shia are slaughtering each other and Israel has nothing to do about it. This is true. But if you look at our history, our the modern history of the Arab world, every single radical movement adopted the liberation of Palestine. So even now, I mean, if you look at Iran, how did Iran enter our communities? I mean, the Arab communities that are mostly Sunni. They are Persian, we are Arab. They are mostly Shia, we are mostly Sunni. You know why? Because they adopted an issue. Since the inception of the Iranian, Iranian revolution, they adopted the liberation of Palestine, the liberation of Jerusalem, even their most Al-Qudrib's al Quds Brigade, the most important part of the IRGC is the Quds Brigade. They named it after Jerusalem. So it's a very important issue. Why did they do this? Because this, let's say, if I say to the Arab world, because this is an issue that is important to the Arab world. Everyone, every, I mean, Bin Laden mentioned Palestine. Even Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, though he was slaughtering Shia, he said that after we finish from them, we will go to, to Israel. So it's now Hassan Nasrallah, when he goes to Aleppo, he says, Tariq, the road to Jerusalem goes to Aleppo. So it's an issue. Though they no one cares about, I know too, but they use it to gain popular legitimacy. So once you solve it in an equitable manner, you know, in a fair manner, because nothing can be sustainable unless it is fair, you know, you'll always have some radical movement that will adopt the Palestinian cause. And now, now with the, you know, Iran lost a lot. Iran, you know, in 2006 had so much, so much, so much uh, popularity in the Arab world. The approval rate was done by Zorbi. They did the poll. It was something 75 or 80%. It was very high, you know. Now it is very, very low. Actually, ironically, they have, Iran has the same approval level rate as Israel. But, you know, now if there is like a third intifada or there is, this is an issue they can use to recreate, to reinvent their legitimacy. So yes, it is very important. And I think once you use it anyway, anyway, once now even to reach an agreement with Iran, Iran cannot, let's say one of the point of contention with the US, isn't it the death to Israel thing, the death to Israel slogan, yeah? If there is a fair settlement with the Palestinians, then you know, Iran can make such a concession, can say there is no need to say death to Israel. I mean, add that hypothetically. You can't, you can't. I mean, it is an issue that is central to all our problems, to all our destructive ideology. I think also if you solve it, you solve the issue, the issue of Palestine, you can get a grand bargain with Iran. Because the issue with Iran is the GCPOA, the issue with it, it was so limited. We need a grand bargain for Iran. And you can't have a grand bargain with Iran unless, unless you solve the Palestinian issue. Otherwise, they will start, I mean, they, they let these people, they, let, they will say, we let our people for 40 years over ideology, over Tahrir Palestine, the liberation of Palestine, and they will give it away just like that. Uh, Bilal, you had a comment? I certainly want to hear from Martin. I mean, veteran negotiator on these issues, but I'll just make a quick point. Uh, Donnie is absolutely right, but I'll add to it that, you know, a just resolution of this conflict still matters beyond the issue of self-determination and justice, obviously, which certainly the Palestinians deserve, is that this could crack the code of further Arab-Israeli security cooperation, which is yeah, extremely important, obviously, in in the region, especially that they face common foes. Uh, and this is essentially what the UAE ambassador to Washington recently wrote in his editorial, right? Um, I would have loved to see the Saudis write that editorial, not the UAE, but that's for another conversation. Um, the Saudis cannot get on board and reach that high potential of cooperation with the Israelis as long as they still hold the title of the custodian of the two holy mosques which means that they also have a responsibility towards the just negotiation of the issue of Jerusalem. There is no way they're going to give up Jerusalem, quote unquote, give up in the absence of uh, a peace agreement between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Um, I mean, they would lose their own country, essentially. The extremists would um, 
uh, once again emerge and they have in the past. I don't need to remind you what happened in 1979, yeah. 2003, 2004 insurrection, um, and even the clergy itself, which is a huge challenge to MBS right now. That would be a huge rallying cost for them. And this is something that he doesn't need, especially when he, he's on a transformative project in the kingdom that re seeks to reduce the influence of the more conservative elements of the clergy. So the Saudis, which let's call them, you know, the biggest piece of this Arab-Israeli security cooperation puzzle, cannot get on board in the absence of a just Israeli-Palestinian peace agreement. Okay, so then, uh, Ambassador, uh, to uh, last question before we go to Q and A, is uh, is okay. All the interests from you know from Dr. Daniel Bilal's comments, <laughs> it seems like the U.S.'s interest is to be a lot cheap, the cheapest and most effective way of solving all its problems in the Middle East is having a an you know a, a, a just and equitable solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Yet they seem to be going in 180 degrees <laughs> the opposite direction. How, how do you how do you explain this? Do you, do you disagree with the assessment of Dr. Daniel Bilal, or do you think there's some sort of dysfunction in the policy? I think you uh, distorted their conclusions. Um, the way I heard uh, Daniel and Bilal, and I, I thought they both expressed it very uh, well and accurately, was that uh, solving the Israeli-Palestinian uh, problem is not going to solve the other problems in the region, but it can help. And I think that's an important distinction to what you said, Omar, which is somehow it's going to magically resolve all the other problems, which it manifestly is not. And I think, well, I think we've reached a point where we can, can acknowledge that. It's a kind of a reasonable middle way between the, the two positions, that either it's irrelevant, which is basically the Israeli and pro-Israeli position, or uh, it will resolve everything. It's the core issue. Um, so it's, it's neither, um, but it would certainly help. And it would certainly help with the priority that I think emerges from this discussion this morning, which is that uh, the powers in the region have to find a way to work together against common threats because they can no longer rely on the United States to do it for them. And that's where a resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, would help. Um, but I think it's also important, and, and this is going to respond to, to Danya's presentation on this issue, it's important to understand that a resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict will involve compromise on both sides. Otherwise, we can't get there. And the compromises that the Palestinians will have to make will not be accepted by Hamas, Hezbollah, Iran. Will not be accepted. And, and I'm talking about a reasonable, fair resolution which obviously the Trump plan is not far from it. But even in it, in, you know, if we go back to the Clinton parameters or Olmert Abu Masson or so on, there are uh, compromises to do with Jerusalem, to do with refugees, uh, right of return, to do with territory that uh, they're never going to accept. So one just has to f put that into your calculations that even if you could resolve it, it's not going to take this issue off the table for those who have not yet come to terms with living in peace uh, with the Jewish state of Israel. Uh, there's one other point, Omar, if you'll allow me, because I know you yeah. want to move to discussion now, and I think it, it needs to be brought out. Here is the logical conclusion, other logical conclusion uh, of our discussion, which is the Gulf Arab states have to find a way to do more in their own defense and have to find a way to work together for that purpose. Because, you know, the writing is on the wall. The United States is not going to be there in the way that they have relied on us to be there in the past. And if the Gulf Arab states imagine 
that the Chinese or the Russians are going to fill in and protect their interests in the way they once depended on the United States to do, they are dreaming. And I think they know that very well. The Russians, the Chinese have their interest in much greater interest in Iran in some ways. And they're certainly going to play both sides off against each other. They are not reliable partners. And so what does that mean? The United States is not pulling out completely. The United States is essentially returning to what I think Bilal, Bilal will agree with was, was a Nixon doctrine. Right. Which is where you stand up, you do more in your defense and we'll help you. You want to and, bring back the Shah? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Not really. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't actually, I don't actually believe that. But yes, finding a way to bring Iran, a different Iran, uh, an Iran that has decided to be a state, not a revolution, into a regional security framework is a long-term objective that the Gulf states and the United States should share. That's another dimension to this. But the Gulf states themselves have to find a way to stop these petty arguments over ridiculous things and end the, end the siege of Qatar and find a way to work together um, because what they face is a common threat that's far more serious than the differences between them. And, and from a US point of view, this is an interest of the United States. We have tried to resolve this issue uh, and yet um, uh, both sides are kind of dug in in a way that, that that makes it impossible, but you're, you're hurting the common effort to protect against the real threats out there. Uh, and I think that that's a critical element uh, in terms of finding a way to make up for the shift in American priorities and interests. That was a, an excellent discussion. Uh, we'll go to some of the questions. Uh, the first question I'll give to Dr. Dania. Um, so this is from uh, Khaled al Khatib uh, regarding the JCPOA. So yes. The JCPOA itself, the GCC countries were not involved in the JCPOA, yeah. nor were they involved in the uh, US withdrawal from the JCPOA. Yeah. Um, how do you, you know, how do you explain that dynamic despite there being such important stakeholders? Well, the JCPOA, I think, was to start with counterproductive because I should, I should just add that uh, Germany were involved. I don't, I don't, why was Germany involved and not the Gulf, the Gulf countries? Germany yeah, even... no, the, the, the whole purpose was it. The whole purpose behind it, the whole logic philosophy was if we deter Iran from becoming, uh, you know, uh, becoming nuclear, that will increase the stability of the region, you know. Well, first of all, when they did it, 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 the GCPOA increased instability because when it was done behind the back of the Saudi, the Saudi really felt very anxious. And what did we have after the GCPOA? Saudi felt that it, it needs to show assertiveness. You know, Sheikh Nimr, who has been on the death row for years, but they were putting it on hold, they did the execution. And this also, as a reaction, you had attacks on their embassy and on their, uh, you know, diplomatic missions in, Ir in Iran, and you had the cutting. Actually, instead of le this leading to a detente, it led to more tension between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, and yeah, so, and also it made the Saudi doubt their ally. I mean, if something that important they do it behind their back how can they trust them with their own security so and also uh, just to tell you something it's not like the the whole obama perspective was you know if we do this agreement then it's like a goodwill gesture then they will be on a good behavior well this was not the case with the iranian at all because they try you know the point is iran is a system it's based on ideology you know, it's based on ideology. It's very important for their people to show that they did not give up on their principle, on the ideology, on, we like, on you know, on the principle of fighting Israel. On, so it's very important for them, these. So they cannot lose faith. Face. So because they did the compromise on the issue of the nuclear, they tried to compensate on other fronts. 
So after the nuclear, after the GCPOA, they became more active and more aggressive when it comes, for example, to non-state actors. So actually the GCPOA was counterproductive. And yes, when the US decided to pull out, it didn't ask. So it act, it act by itself, which is not very comforting for, for, for the Saudi and for its allies here. Uh, Bilal? Look, there's a simple answer. Um, we have different priorities at the time. Um, the Obama administration was most worried about the Iranians ever acquiring a intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missile with a nuclear head. And so that was their number one priority, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Gulf states were obviously worried about something else, or worried about the sectarian drive of Iran across the region, which the president himself, and he was pretty clear about that, in multiple mediums with a conversation with Jeffrey Goldberg and others that he thought that that was exaggerated by the Gulf states. And so that difference in priorities in many ways explains why they were not included. Also, I say less significant, we knew that that was a bunch that was not in agreement on everything with regard to Iran. So to include all of them would have been a pain in the neck. Now, I'm not saying that that's the right thing to do to exclude them. I've always been of the opinion that it would have been the right thing to consult with them and to try to address their security interests, especially on such a monumental agreement, obviously. But that's, that was the reasoning of the Obama administration. I don't agree with it, but that's how they thought. And there was, lastly, an operational consideration. With such high-level talks, there's always a risk of leaks. And the more people you include in such negotiations, the greater the risk of leaks. And they wanted to keep it as tight as possible. I mean, even the Israelis were not, you know, consulted on all those issues. And this is, <laughs> if there's anything that we've agreed on this morning, is that they're the number one partner in, in the United, of the United States and the region. On many levels, they were not included in that conversation. They were briefed about it, but there's a very different there's a difference between being briefed and coordinating on something. And so that's why they were not involved. It was not the right thing to do, but it's just a different priorities and nothing else. Can I just add uh, one yes, other thing about quickly? Ambassador, yes. Uh, just from a point of view of a negotiator, to include the issues, uh, uh, regional issues, in the agenda would have made it very more very complicated on top of everything else that Bilal and, and Bami have said would have made the negotiation very complicated and would have allowed Iran to play one concern off against the other that is to say to agree to kinds of down to lower the flame in the in the region and its hegemonic ambitions in the region in exchange for more lenient terms on the nuclear deal. And so I think part of the judgment that was made on top of everything else that's been mentioned was, you know, that'll only play to, his, to Iran's advantage and therefore let's just focus on the nuclear and get that done and we'll focus on the other issues later. Right. Okay, so we have Which a question to you. Which never Which happened. I mean, it was never, you know, the, they never built on that agreement to address the other concerns. And that was the main problem. It wasn't just the fact that they were not consulted. It was the fact that all of those concerns were overlooked later on. Right. Uh, Ambassador, we have a question from Dr. Khan al-Bakr, um, who says, how likely is it for decision makers in the Gulf region to seek new strategic alliances with countries that might hold beliefs and agendas that are counter to the US's beliefs. This is builds on your comment you made at the end of the session. So uh, is it realistic for the Gulf countries to form new strategic partnerships with countries, presumably, I guess, Russia or China, or is that, uh, is that just a uh, uh, sort of grandstanding? Or posturing, oh, I should say. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's obvious at a time like this, that countries who are so exposed, um, like uh, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Bahrain, uh, to look uh, to see if there are others that will help in the, in terms of uh, ensuring their security. And um, China, let, let's just kind of deal with China first up. China, as Bilal says, doesn't really have the capability, at least not yet. Uh, but secondly. 
China has been extremely wary about getting involved in this part of the world. India actually might be, in some ways, a, a better prospect, more reliable. India does have interest in the region, all of the Indian expats in the Gulf, uh, for example, and of course, it's a large consumer of uh, oil and, and gas from, from the region. Uh, but India too uh, has another concern, which is Iran is on its borders. Iran is critically important in Pakistan from an Indian perspective. So they're not so keen to take one side uh, in this uh, dispute. In fact, they're very reluctant to do so. And so there you're, you're left with Russia and Turkey. Now we know enough about um, the uh, competition, let's say, between Turkey and the Gulf states to, to rule that one out, except of course in the case of Qatar. Um, but uh, the candidate that's left is Russia. And Russia has been playing a more important role in the region, filling in the vacuum uh, that's left by American retrenchment. Uh, you see them active uh, in Syria, of course, um, but also uh, in Libya now. Uh, but the Russians, first of all, it's important to understand they have military capabilities, um, but, but their other capabilities are, are quite small, particularly their economic capabilities. Um, their their uh, interest in Iran is probably as great as I've described in India's or, or China's. Um, and, and so uh, they, they cannot be counted on uh, to have the best interests of the Gulf states uh, at heart. And so when, you know, if you do any kind of serious accounting of what the prospects are here, you come back to the proposition I just previously made, which is build your own capabilities, work with your, with your Gulf Arab neighbors um, to the extent that you can bring Egypt out of strategic hibernation. Good luck with that. Um, try to, to get uh, work with Egypt and Jordan and then Israel and the United States. And, and somehow that is the best uh, uh, alternative, I think, that the Gulf states have, the Gulf Arab states have. Okay. Uh, oh yes, uh, Dr. Dania, you have a comment? I have a small comment on regarding rapprochement with other people, with, with, with others, you know, actors. You know, the US is very clear on the fact that it wants the Gulf to be more su su sufficient, you know, you know, when it comes to security, uh, Obama says, I care about the middle class more than the Middle East. Trump says, you know, we spent so much money, several trillion. I want to bring back those boys home. Uh, um, uh, Pompeo tells them you need to do the Arab, uh, Arab, uh, Arab NATO. But the U.S. acts like a jealous ex. So at the same time, they, want, they don't want the engagement, but... When they see any kind of rapprochement with Russia with, or with China or what, they get really upset, you know. When they, Saudi Arabia even thought about acquiring S-400, they were really, really upset. Okay, um, uh, Bilal, sounds like a question. Good tactic. Hmm? I said it sounds like a good tactic. <laughs> a question from uh, a local journalist, Sandeep Grewal, uh, for you, Bilal. Uh, so you agreed uh, with Ambassador that the Gulf countries need to come up with their own, or need to contribute towards their own security architecture. Uh, how, how likely is that? Uh, so you've assessed that this is something that is in their interests. Is it something that it's likely to happen? Um, Ambassador just mentioned, in a, you know, forging better relationships with Egypt and, and Israel, uh, with Egypt and Jordan, and then later on further afield. Do you think it is realistic for the Gulf countries and these other countries to, to do something homegrown, or are there, is it always going to be uh, dependent on an external power? I mean, it's, it's going to take more than a week. You know, I mean, even more, far more developed countries in Europe that are part of the NATO alliance rely on the United States for military technology. I mean, there's nothing really unique about the dependence of the Gulf states on the United States. I mean, even Britain requires military technology that we have. And so the question becomes, how do you 
you know, build up your forces in ways that could compensate for what Martin was saying about this relative withdrawal of capabilities, assets, and troops of the United States. It's never going to be self-sufficiency or complete independence. That's a pipe dream. Uh, but there is a case to be made for stepping up. And I think they, I think they totally understand it. I don't think there's a lack of ambition there. I don't think there's a lack of willingness. It's a lack of organization and a lack of unity and the political differences that Martin has mentioned. I mean, this whole Arab military alliance idea or project is very old, okay? They've tried it several times with the Egyptians, with the Syrians, and it never worked. It's not because of hardware. It was because of politics and lack of organization and planning. So it starts there, and as long as this house is divided for petty reasons, as Martin described them, you know, this whole issue of military modernization and development is always going to have a ceiling. And so you start there, you still have the British who are back, you know, and we, we forget about the British, they're back to Bahrain. The French have a base in the UAE. And so you still have a consortium of powerful actors that could be further relied on in addition to the United States. This is still always going to be a heavily penetrated region. And so it's a matter of how do you take advantage of those partners who are physically present on the ground. So there's a, there's a course, halfway, the, sorry, very brief, there was a halfway house, which is the MISA, the Middle East Strategic Alliance, which was launched, I think, uh, about a year and a half ago, which is supposed to be US plus the Gulf States plus uh, Jordan and, and Egypt. Do you think that is something that could potentially be a bridge or do you think that's a, uh, you know, a dead on arrival? No, that's a joke. That's a... I mean, that was more a political construct than anything else to message to the Iranians that there is some kind of a unified front against them. But, you know, in reality, there was really nothing, uh, at least uh, militarily speaking, that really had legs. I mean, we all understood that there were still significant differences uh, amongst those groups. And that tells you why the Egyptians <laughs> didn't really last long and they withdrew. Um, so well, it's Misa or any other form of alliance that you can think of, uh, you know, at least at least start bilaterally. And I don't need to tell you, you know, the challenges that the Saudis and the Emiratis, as close as they are, have faced to try to actually come up with a formal alliance, and they haven't. And so you can imagine if on a bilateral level, it's that difficult and challenging. Can you imagine on a group level or multilateral level? It's not easy. And militarily speaking, also integrating different assets, it's difficult business. Uh, they have different platforms. They buy from everybody. And so interoperability is a problem. We've been preaching interoperability with them forever. Now, some of them get it, but you know they have different systems. Look at the categories, how many systems do they have? They have French, British, American, uh, some Eastern European. And how do you integrate all that stuff? So you've got a technical challenge, you've got a political challenge, and most importantly, you've got a priority challenge. I don't think they see this yet as a priority, even though they should, as Martin said. I mean, you know, the writing is on the wall. Okay, we have a, a question, an intervention from Dr. Marwa uh, Maziad from the Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington. Uh, Dr. Maziad, please go ahead. I think you're on mute, but yeah, yes, go ahead. Uh, so can you hear me now? Yes. Hi. Okay, so um, my question is uh, for Ambassador Martin Indik. And uh, from what you stated, it just actually seems that Israel's survival and security issue is indeed solved. And I do agree with that. Um, I think I'm more optimistic about um, Israel's integration with other Arab countries than maybe Dania and Bilal seem to be. And uh, my question in that regard is that it seems that the common threat to um, a, a coalition of Egypt, UAE, Arabia and Bahrain is more um, a Turkey, Qatar, pan-Islamist, Sunni hegemonic project than just exclusively an Iranian uh, Shia threat. So what do you say, seems like nobody really mentioned Turkey much at all, uh, or the Muslim Brotherhood or the pan-Islamist ideas in the region, so it seems to me that I would like to ask you, how do you see um, that side of the ideological divide moving forward into the future? You know, uh, thank you for the question. I, I uh, have 
have trouble um, understanding uh, the depth of this ideological divide as you describe it. And so um, that may be just from ignorance on my part, well, I think I've tried to follow it quite closely. It seems to me that that um, Turkey, Turkey's role in the region is an important one, but it's a severely circumscribed one. And it, like the Iranians, you know, Turkey has been able to exploit the differences within the Arab world, the cracks, to, to build its influence. And uh, it's most advantaged by the way in which uh, the Muslim Brotherhood threat has been kind of blown up into this, this major uh, uh, danger um, to the region, to regimes in the region, so on. And, you know, maybe I, I haven't been exposed to it in the way that Egyptians, for instance, have. But, but you know, when they tried, they failed. And uh, the, the, the notion that they're going to topple regimes in the region uh, seems to me, you know, a little exaggerated. Uh, and so, you know, there's, there's one way of dealing with it is to say it's actually not that much of a threat and we should find a way to reduce the opportunities for Turkey to exploit that. Um, and, and there have been various efforts at that in the past, but they've never been uh, sustained. Um, so, I, you know, I think Bilal has described very well, I thought, in, in his last answer, uh, the challenges uh, that are there uh, that have to be overcome on an urgent basis. They can't be overcome if, you know, the, the states that we're talking about are going to focus on um, what divides them uh, and these ideological differences uh, that, that um, seem to me not to be uh, genuine security uh, threats. And, and uh, say again, Turkey, Turkey, I can well understand the concern that they have about Turkey, but you know, Tur Turkey has been there. There's an experience uh, of Turkey's attempt to exercise hegemony in the region, and there's very few uh, who would want a, a return to that situation. Um, so again, I think, I think it's, that's the lesser problem in my view than the problems that Bilal has outlined. Uh, well, with that, uh, I wish to draw the session to a close. I would like to thank uh, our guests for their uh, uh, very valuable insights and for their time. Uh, I would like to thank also all the uh, attendants, all the people who joined into the session today, and thank you for the questions and, and thank you for listening so attentively. Uh, and we hope you can join us for future Dirasat events uh, uh, online and uh, offline hopefully when when the circumstances permit uh, and with that i would like to wish everybody an enjoyable evening if you're in the middle east or a morning if you're uh, uh, in the us uh, and see you in, in future events thank you very much thank, thank you Omar. Thank, thank you bilal thank you martin thank, thank you bye-bye thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.